USS Slater performance characteristics on September 1945. Length, more than 93 meters. Beam, more than 11 meters. Draft, more than 3 meters. Total displacement, 1,620 tons. Armament, three single 3-inch, three 50 cal Mark 22 guns. They were originally designed, the destroyer escorts were supposed to have the very effective five inch 38 caliber gun, which fired a 54 pound projectile. But because supply of out distance demand, they couldn't make these guns fast enough. So destroyer escorts ended up with kind of an obsolete three inch 50 caliber gun that only fired a 26 pound projectile. Anti-aircraft artillery, six 40 millimeters Bofors guns in twin mounts, 18 20 millimeter Oerlikon guns in twin mounts, anti-submarine armament and torpedoes, hedgehog anti-submarine mortar, one triple 21 inch torpedo tubes as commissioned, eight depth charge projectors, two depth charge racks, power plant, 4 GM mod, 16-278A diesel engines with electric drive. Power, around 6,000 horsepower. Maximum speed, 21 knots. Cruising range, 10,800 miles, a 12 knot speed. Cannon class escort destroyer crew, up to 220 men. And here they go, sailors who've never been on a ship on board a ship that's never been to sea. But before they do any fighting, the ship and her crew spend some time in getting acquainted, a shakedown. I got on board, and the chief says, kid, what are you here for? I said, I'm here to be an electrician mate. And he says, you may want to be an electrician mate, but we need engine men. So I wound up in the engine room. Boat's room was always over 100 degrees temp temperature wise, and you'd be rolling almost over on its side. Everybody was getting seasick, and it would be going this way as well as this way, and sometimes both. And you'd have to serve your duty on watches, whether you were seasick or not. Such a small ship, but it was a good game. We had some good times together, and we had some, once in a while, we had a little battle. A little fisticuffs, but uh, when you're out to sea for three, three and a half weeks, and you don't see anybody, you don't have good food, you get on each other's nerves. When we went on Liberty, we didn't care if it was a boatswain mate from top deck or engine man from bottom deck. We went, we partied. Sailors are sure to find courteous, uniformed guides who will point out the recommended places, and those not quite so highly thought of. It doesn't take long to get the sailors' handsome luggage on board, but it does take time to stow an amazing amount of ammunition. Depth charges are still among the most effective weapons against submarines, so we take a few along. During the war, the small ships did a great, great deal. They, they freed up everything, all the big ones, so they could go. In other words, we did the convoy work, we did the patrol work, uh, we patrolled the harbors and so forth. We, the, the convoys met the battle, the destroy, uh, submarines. Uh, we also, they used a lot of small ships in the invasions. So they, not only did they convoy in, but they were firepower to fight aircraft, they use them for aircraft. In case of necessity, 
escort destroyers could defend against any attacking surface ships or aviation. But nonetheless, their primary task was to fight against enemy submarines. For that purpose, USS Slater and other Cannon-class ships were equipped with state-of-the-art surveillance systems for that time. In addition, the ship had a very small turning circle radius, providing good maneuverability. We would send out a signal, and the signal would bounce off something and come back to us. That was a sign that we were perhaps had a submarine. Now, of course, it could have been caused by other things, rocks on the bottom or various other things. We had to determine by the nature of the sound what it was that you were looking at and whether the, the object moved too, or the submarine would move where the rock wouldn't, you know. World War II sonar had a problem. It could only scan ahead of the ship. So when a destroyer escort got on top of a submarine, it lost contact so that the submarine is trying to get out from under you. So to solve this problem, the World War II destroyer escort wanted to put as many depth charges in the water as it could in a short period of time over a wide area. So to do that, we had the two depth charge racks and the fantail, and then we also had the depth charge projectors, four on each side of the ship. And with a depth charge projector, you basically were throwing a depth charge over the side of the ship about 75 yards. And the way this worked was it had an impulse charge in it, and you put the impulse charge into the breach, and then that black powder explosion would detonate and blow this arbor plate over the side. The separation point was right here, and the de depth charge was chained to it, and that would go out about 75 yards. So you've got four of these going off either side, and you've got dropping four off the back end, so you're getting as wide an area as you can to try to sink that submarine. These were pressure sensitive, basically. You set the, uh, the depth that you wanted the depth charge to explode at, and at that depth, the water pressure would uh, overcome spring tension and detonate the depth charge. So you had to guess what the de depth of the submarine was. of that was all that noise in the water basically destroyed any chance the sonar operator would have of hearing the submarine. To overcome these problems, the Brit British developed a World War II anti-submarine rocket called the Hedgehog. Basically, the Hedgehog was a 24 projectile launcher that fired this type of projectile over the forward gun against the submarine. You had the propellant back here, explosive charge right here that would actually pierce the submarine's hull, and a fuse on the end that actually rotated when it hit the water, so it was like a safety feature that kept us from detonating aboard the ship. Now, these only fire detonated if, if it actually hit the submarine. So if you got an explosion with one of these rockets, you basically knew that you hit the submarine. Other than that, they would just fall to the bottom. And this turned out to be a much more effective weapon against the su submarines than the depth charge. In 1943, the entire anti-submarine defense system began operating at full strength as a united mechanism. It comprised ship-borne seek and destroy groups, escort aircraft carriers, and land-based anti-submarine aviation. Additionally, the method of defining the approximate location of German submarines using radio direction finders was deployed. And also we come out with what they call a huff-duff, which was nothing but a a radio detector, a signal detector, and what they set up stations along the coast, they would try to pick up the German when they talked on the radio, and we would also at sea with our ship, we would try to pick them up, and where the two of them crossed, we knew that's where the German sub was, and we could send air, we send airplanes out, or ships that were close to that, and we got a lot of the German subs this way. According to the statistics from the headquarters of Fleet 10 of the US, commanding and coordinating the entire system of anti-submarine defense across the Atlantic, every enemy submarine destroyed in 1941 was equal to 16 Allied vessels sunk. 
1943, that number was reduced to two vessels for every submarine destroyed. And in the spring of 1944, Germans paid with a submarine sunk for almost every destroyed Allied vessel. The Kriegsmarine submarines managed to sink just two Allied escort destroyers. By the end of summer 1944, German submarines turned out to be completely incapable of cutting off the supply lines from the USA to a new front in Europe. Seek and destroy groups and small escort destroyers within those groups won the battle for the Atlantic with the aid of radar, high-frequency direction finders and multi-barrel projectors, as well as the coordinated action and the dedication of their crews. When you get up in those situations, you feel fear. I mean, I, the only thing is, you do things automatic. You don't even think you think about doing it. People were trained so well that it helped. They were designed to be the best. They met enemies face to face endured tragedies and enjoyed victories. They went down in history due to the bravery of their crews. They are the ships that deserve to be called Naval Legends.